I'm not very much of a singer, but I have a song I'd like to share with you. Uh, three, four weeks ago, time, I kind of, can you hear me? I, I don't want you to miss the message tonight, so I, I, I want to make sure that you all can hear me, okay? Um, because I'm excited about what I'm going to share with you. It's so real to me. And I'm really excited about what God is doing and the reality that he's bringing forth and revealing uh, by his spirit. Uh, like I think about three weeks ago, I've done so many camps, I forget how many weeks ago, which camp was when. But at the camp in Silver Bay, the Lord gave a gal a song that really speaks of where I am. I have taught it, I have believed it, and now God's put it in song, in verse. And, you know, I think it's real nice of him, you know, to kind of like confirm us. You know, he, he kind of firms us up a little bit. Okay, and I can't sing too well, but I, I want to share that. They want to help me. It's, uh, you know, my basis for the reality that I have is that I touched center. And I believe the word of God when he said, Christ in me the hope of glory. Paul said, I'll show you a mystery that has heretofore been hidden through eons and eons of ages, but now has been made revealed, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when I touched that reality, God moved from somewhere beyond the sun, moon, and stars and moved really in my heart. Now, I had had a born-again experience with Jesus. And I knew Jesus in a real way. But when I saw that passage of Scripture in Colossians 1, that Christ in me, the hope of glory, I began to deal with Christ as a living presence within my body. And you know, Colossians 2, 9 says that it pleased God the Father that in Christ Jesus should dwell all the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form. And then the 10th verse said, and you are made full and complete. You have come to full spiritual stature. In you too dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit resident within you. And when I grasp that, not just as a word, but as a reality, something began to happen. I stopped seeking out and reaching out, and I began to reach in. And then the word of God goes on to say, until Christ filleth all in all in us. And that takes a new mind. And this girl got up and sang this song that the Lord gave her, and it's called, I Am the Center. And it's a very simple song, and if you can get past my cracks in my voice, you know, but hear what the Lord is saying, uh, I kind of think it's kind of fantastic. I am the center, I am sufficient, I am everything you need. Come I am 
And you know, in Colossians, uh, he, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians, the fourth chapter and the 13th verse. It says something that maybe your, my Bible reads a little differently from yours. But uh, it says that <laughs> Paul is saying, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. In other words, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Hallelujah. Isn't that fantastic? I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, I stand tonight in my inadequacy and I bow to your all-sufficiency. And as I behold your all-sufficiency, it becomes my sufficiency. Thank you, Lord, for your sufficiency. Thank you, Lord, for your wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for your ability and power to proclaim your word. Lord, be yourself in me and speak to your people. Deliver your message for the praise of your glory. And I declare that the tempter's snare is broken and he has no ground in this assembly. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. My message tonight is good news. I've got good news. <laughs> and I'm so excited about the good news of the gospel. The gospel of peace. You know, I, I get so excited when I, I touch the realities of the word of God. I want to declare to you the four angels, principalities, powers of the air, everything that was, everything that's going to be, that Satan has no ground. And my message tonight is no ground. And I pray the Father that he release you to the reality and the excitement of the fact that, that he has no ground. And nobody can say to, to the enemy of your soul that you have no ground except a believer who knows that Christ possesses all in all in him. And we only learn this as we look into the word. In Ephesians, the second chapter in the fifth verse, that's where my brother was at this morning. But he never got around to the fifth verse. <laughs> and I watched God let him play all around it, and I said, thank you, Jesus, keep him off my ground. <laughs> you know? It says that while we were dead, slain by our shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. God the Father gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life which he has quickened unto him. That you and I tonight, having received Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior, have the same life that he had. And all Satan ever attempted to do in Jesus was to try to possess some ground in him. And he never got around to it. And do you know when Jesus was getting ready to go and knew that it was his time and he was going to the cross, do you know what he said? He said, the prince of this earth is coming. But I don't have to fear him because there's nothing in me that belongs to him. In other words, he said, there's no ground in me that belongs to him. 
And if Christ filleth all in all in us, our testimony is any time the enemy comes with any of his tricks is no ground. There is no resting place for you. You know, God made man to be his habitation. We are supposed to express the very life of Jesus Christ. And you know, the scripture says that he looks at us as one that looketh into a mirror. And when one looks into a mirror, he doesn't expect to see mirror. He is looking for his own reflection. And that as God looks at us, Paul, he, when he looks at you, he's looking to see himself. You see. And that just like Jesus became the visible representation of the invisible God, so in you, are you and I becoming the visible representation of the incarnate Christ that dwelleth within us. And as mirrors, you have never seen a mirror check out its own self to find out whether it's clean or dirty. Even a child understands what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. You know, the mirror never knows it's dirty. It's the one who looks in it knows when the smudges is on the mirror. And the one that looks at the mirror to see his reflection when he sees a smudge, he's the one that applies the cleaner to the mirror. And you see, he does that, beloved, by taking from the depths of our subconscious those things that smudge our outward reflection of the character of God. And he brings it to the height of our consciousness, and we say, God, I don't want this. There's no ground in me for this. You see, and I want to get rid of it. So the Lord says, all right, I will apply the cleaner. You all use Windex, and I use the blood of Jesus. <laughs> so he takes and he applies the blood of Jesus, which is God's cleanser. And then he looks at the mirror, and what does he see? Where the smudge was that was blocking out his character, he can now see that portion of himself being reflected how? Through Paul. Through the mirror. You know, God's mirror, God's ability does two things to the mirror. It not only reflects himself, but it also transforms the mirror. Oh, isn't that good news? You know, when I discovered that, I thought, oh, wow, you know? And you know what a mirror is? And you know when we become really mirrors for God? We become mirrors for God when we're willing to be honest, we're willing to be exposed, and we're willing to be open, and to stand naked before God and say, Lord, like Hal Hill says, help yourself to me, Jesus. Huh? And then the Lord says, okay, and he begins to root and to dig. But the enemy does not want us to know, the enemy of our soul does want, not want us to know that we're being transformed. So he comes along, old Sufoot, and he says, hey, Tom, you're no good. And until, instead of Tom saying, no ground, he said, yeah, I know. And the enemy jumps right on him. And he said, that's a foothold I have. But Ephesians 4.27 says, give no place to the enemy. Give no foothold and no room for him. So it's up to the believer to say, no room, no ground, no ground. Oh, I tell you, it's so exciting that I can tell the enemy of my soul when it comes to bring sickness, when it comes to bring disease, when it comes to bring anxiety, when it comes to bring fear, when it comes to, to shake me up. I can say, hey, wait a minute, there's no room, no ground, no ground, you know. And that ought to be the cry of every believer, no ground. No ground, you know, that's our flag. No ground. There's no room in here for me. I'm fully occupied. I got full occupancy. But you see, when the enemy comes along, we've got all these, no va we've got all these vacancy signs out. You know, sure, I got a little room for you. Come on in. You know? And if things don't go our way, we sit down and have a pity party. And when we start having a pity party, it's like having a birthday party. And the, and the one that comes to our party is Satan. And he brings all his little gifts with him and all his imps. 
And they come in and they bring the gift of resentment and the gift of, gift of bitterness and the gift of sadness and the gift of depression. And you just say, yeah, okay, you know, and you take them all in. But if you know who you are and Christ is really living in your heart, you can say, wait a minute, ain't no ground. Hell, I thought they was going to get excited. <laughs> I really thought they was going to get excited. But I'm going to tell it anyhow, whether you get excited or not. You know, and I, I began to really, really ponder this. You know, when Jesus was getting ready to go, uh, you know, he said, the prince of this earth has been tried. And, and he said, sentence is passed on him already. And you know why? Because he couldn't find any ground in Jesus. He tempted him in every point so he could find some place to stand. And beloved, if we knew what God has done for us, you know, we're so sin conscious that we're not Christ conscious. You know that? And the Lord said and made it very plain in Psalms, the 32nd chapter, I'm talking about God the Father. In Psalms 32, it says, Blessed and happy to be envied is the man whose God takes no account of his wrongdoing. You know, God don't take no account of your wrongdoing. As far as he's concerned, the sin question is finished. And he said, Evelyn, do you know why I don't take any account of your wrongdoing? And I said, no, Lord. He said, because I accept the cross of my son Jesus. I accepted the sacrifice that he paid. And as far as I'm concerned, that debt is paid in full. But my people don't know that. He said, let them know that the sin question is done. Then I'm not sitting down with a tablet marking off and checking off their wrongdoings. And I thought, oh, wow, that's out of sight, you know, because I had been raised with a sin conscience, you know, that everything that I didn't do right was sin, and I had to pay for my sins. What about you, Hal? Did you have that problem? And then I said, well, that, you know, how you can argue, well, that's under the law, and that's, that's what God said. He said, uh-uh, Ev, you know, I put it in my new covenant, too, Romans 4, 7, and 8, you know. And I looked at Romans Four, seven, and eight, and you know what? To my utter amazement, it says the same identical thing. Blessed and happy to be envied is the man whose God takes no account of his wrongdoing. So when the enemy comes along to tell you oh, what a sinner you are, you have to be able to say, No ground. Absolutely no ground. You know, I gave my life to the Lord, in case y'all didn't know it. And uh, I began, you know, some people, the last camp I got, one woman got, several people got mad at me because they kept saying, you make it so simple, you make it so simple. And I said, I don't know if these people are gonna get as hung up in me making it simple as I do, but you know, it is. It is so simple that we miss it. You see, most uh, eggheads, like he's talking about them, really highly intelligent people, they miss a lot of the simple things. But Paul said, let's get back to the simplicity of Christ. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't heavy. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So I, I began to uh, ponder how I was going to share no ground with you. And several things came up today. And... Uh, I said, oh, Lord, how can I make this so simple that they will understand? Along with what I am really using as a theme, a renewed mind and development. And, and so I decided that the Lord kind of brought to my remembrance how he did something in my life. And I, I just pray as I share this with you that you will get the, the effect of what I'm talking about when I say no ground. You know, we do an awful lot of striving to be what we say we are. And I stand up and I say to you, everything I need, I have. And some people get upset about that, you know. And I say that you've got to develop, but you can't develop until you possess, okay? I became aware 
of my actions and my reactions. And I said, Lord, I don't want any portion of my life untouched by you. And I said, Lord, I want you to control my actions and my reactions by your spirit. I want you to control my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit, my sex life, my passions, my desires, everything that makes up my personality, I want you through the power of your spirit to control it. So I said, Lord, I don't know if I have ever asked you to control my actions and my reactions. I said, but Lord, I want you to control my actions and my reactions. And he said, okay, Ev, I'll control them, but you've got to be willing to react. That's fair enough, right? So I said, okay, Lord. So I let it, I let it lay, believing and trusting God that he was gonna do just what I asked him to do. And a, a couple days later, I found that I had to go somewhere and speak and lead a Bible study. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to share with your, your people? And he didn't say anything. And I said, okay. I proceeded. I asked him for two days, and he didn't say anything. And the week before, he showed me in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against master spirits and wickedness in high places. And I had asked the Lord for a week what was a master spirit. And I didn't get any answer. So I didn't have a message. I didn't know what a master spirit was. The Lord had told me to ask questions, but don't probe. Want answers, but don't probe. And I said, okay. So I asked the questions and leave them and figure when he get around to it, he'll answer them. So I proceeded to get dressed and drive, and I had to go about 40 miles away from home. And I had to go on a two-lane highway. And I was on this two-lane highway. And they talk about women being terrible drivers. And I was in a no-passing zone going, and then you have to know Pennsylvania, it's hilly, you know, and you go up and down hills and around hills. And we've got a lot of no-passing zones, you know, that you can't pass on. So I found myself on this two-lane highway behind the worst male driver I have ever been behind in my life. Now remember, I'm talking about no ground, okay? So I got behind this man, and I got mad. And I can get mad to white heat. And I could feel this white heat just consuming me. And I said, well, I'm supposed to praise you in all things. OK, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm still mad. <laughs> and do you know, to my utter amazement, God didn't fall off his throne. The clouds did not stop rolling, you know. The sun continued to shine, and everything went on as usual, and God didn't get upset because I said I was man. And I said, well, I'm supposed to praise you, but hey, God, I wasn't praising you. I just gave you lip service. And I said, come on, Holy Spirit of God, help me to praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And he said, and, you know, I do pray in tongues. I'm sorry if it disturbs you, but it helps me a whole lot. Uh, and, you know, naturally when I said, come on, Holy Spirit, it helped me to praise the Lord. I, you know, expected that I was going off in my prayer language. And to my utter amazement, I didn't. I, found, I heard myself, Paul, praying a prayer. I was driving my car. And I said, oh, dear Jesus, that man is lost. And just like that man is lost, so are there many souls on the highway of life that are lost. Please, Jesus, let me be a road sign on the highway of life to point to the way. And I said, I didn't know that man was lost. You know, in my consciousness, I didn't. And that's the reason why he was driving so stupidly on the road. He was lost. But the Holy Spirit knew that man was lost. And then the Lord said to me, and of course, you know, as soon as I prayed that prayer, the man moved. He just disappeared, you see. And the Lord said to me, Evelyn, you're an illegitimate child. 
And I said, well, yeah, what else is new? You know, I've known that 40 some years, okay. He said to me, what did you do to be born? I said, nothing, Lord. He said, do you know that there are no illegitimate children? He said, I am the author of life. And there is not a child that is born in the world that I am not aware of the fact that it has come into the world. Now, there are promiscuous parents, but no illegitimate children. And I swallowed, you know, and I said, you know, okay. So he said to me, you know, you were a very happy little girl. He said, until you start walking into rooms and people start whispering behind your hands and you got uncomfortable and you start looking at yourself and looking around to see if he was okay. And he said, and then you discovered that it wasn't the norm not to have a daddy in the house, so you made up stories, you lied. And then you'd been taught that you're not supposed to lie, so then you got fearful because you lied. And then he said, and then you got mad at your mother for putting you in the position to have to lie, and you got full of resentment and bitterness, and he went to ticking it all off. And I'm driving down this highway, 50 miles an hour, and all of this is going on. And then right in front of me, God began to show me a wheel. And he showed me all the resentment and all the bitterness and the anger and so forth. And he said, you know, Ev, you've taken care of all of these. He said, but you know one thing? He said, you never got around to getting rid of the hub of the wheel. And I said, the hub? He said, yes. He said, the hub of the wheel is shame. He said, you've been ashamed all of your life for your birth. And do you know, beloved, it was like when God said shame, it was like a hand that went down into the core of my being and snatched out a big, gloppy mass. He said, you know, shame is one of the biggest master spirits out of the pit of hell. And he said, you see, before I couldn't get rid of it for you because it had so many little tentacles and you would have resisted. But today I have brought you to the place where I can reach down and you're willingly going to give up and I can take all of the tentacles and all the little roots and everything out. And he said, there won't be any room for anything else. So he said, I'll put in the place where that was love and peace, assurance, and what I see that you have need of to build you up to be what you are. And there won't be no room, no ground for anything else. The enemy will never be able to use that against you. And when he comes back to taunt you about your past, all you can say is, no ground. No ground. Jesus took care of that for me, you see, because he put it under the blood, and he set me free. Beloved, he said, the wise man will build his house on a rock. But the foolish man will hear what I have to say and he'll build his house on sand. And do you know, beloved, sand is all ground. But when you stand rooted and grounded and established in Jesus, he's the rock. And in Jesus, there's no room for taunting. There's no room for accusations. There's no room for fear. And do you know what fear is? Perfect faith in failure. It is the opposite of faith in him. He said fear has torment. 
He that fears is not made perfect in love. When we stand rooted and grounded in love, we can say to the enemy of our soul, no room, no ground. But it's only as he comes with his taunts. And he says, you know, you're a sinner. And you say, yeah, I am. And you deny the fact that you are a child of God. Now, don't misunderstand me and say that Rev. Ev is going around telling people that they won't sin. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that you're a child of God and you do not sit down and habitually decide to sin. Okay? You don't sit down today and decide that what you're going to do wrong next week. And he said that we have an advocate with the Father. That if we sin, he's and ask him, he's faithful and just to forgive us for our sins. So we can still holler, no ground. Absolutely no ground. And do you know every time that we say to the enemy of our souls, no ground, we are reflecting and being transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus and of God the Father. And we're taking on the likeness. And instead of doing like Adam did and trying to fight on his own, we'll go back to the word. And we stand on the living word, which is the rock Jesus, and say, no ground. You can't possess me. There's no room in here for you because I am equal to all things. I can do anything through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. No ground. No ground. What a freedom God has given us in this relationship. What a war cry that we have. And you know, I lived in the land of the Israelites for a long time. I was one of the most miserable Christians but you know what the Lord told them when he sent them into the promised land? He said, possess the land. Jesus said, occupy till I come. When I come, will I find faith in the land? God he said, if you don't kill everything that's in the land that I've given you to occupy, the thing that you leave will be the very thing that will rise up to destroy you. So what God is saying is get rid of everything that's in you that's not of me and that there be no ground or no foothold for the enemy to stand on. So when he comes, you can say no ground, no room because Christ is filling all in all in me. What a privilege that we have to say no ground when sickness comes and no ground. Why? Because Jesus Christ paid the price on Calvary by his stripes. I am healed. Our, our healing has been set, sitting out in the midst of time and eternity, waiting for you and I for 2,000 years to get around to claiming it. We claim sickness before we claim deliverance. But when we stand up and say, I don't have to take this because the health and the vigor of God is mine and on the strength of his word and the finished work of Jesus Christ, there's no ground in here. You can't settle here. No ground. No ground. I, you know, that to me is the most exciting thing. It's something stirs in me every time I say, no ground. The life of Christ, you know, because when we begin to stand on God's word and we begin to act out what he said is ours, that we are claiming and possessing the land. And the more we possess the land, the more Christ springs up in us and the spirit of God fills up and possesses the land in us and about us. And we are becoming right now in manifestation everything that the Lord says. Because 1 John 2, 6 says that he that saith he abideth in him. Whosoever saith that Jesus lives in him ought to walk even as he walked, and he never gave ground to Satan. Do you know why God himself, this is just a challenge, you don't have to agree, but take it as a challenge. Do you know why God does not fight Satan? The reason he doesn't fight him is that God made man 
to that he might possess all of man and reflect himself and all he has been doing is going around reproducing himself and he's taken away from Satan the ground that he says is his so there won't be no room for Satan to stand and he don't have to fight him he just put him out because there ain't no ground <laughs> praise the Lord Praise the Lord. So you see, beloved, as we possess the land and come out of the land of the Israelites into the kingdom of God, which is possessing the land that is flowing with milk and honey, there ain't no ground. But we've got to be willing to kill, to die, and, and to die out to everything that is negative. Do you know what your new nature is? Paul, answer me. Do you know what your new nature is? The new nature of the believer is love. And do you know that any negative thing that comes to you that is not of love, you don't have to receive it. You can say, wait a minute, that's not of me. That's not my nature. I don't have to take a negative thought. God didn't make me a garbage dump. You know, you don't have to take that crap. But if you see when we stand here and nod and say, mm-hmm, that's ground. That gives Satan a foothold to jump in. Do you know what the word of God says about Judas? It says the thought entered his mind, then Satan entered his heart, and he, he betrayed Jesus. The thought received gave him the room, the right to go and get his thought because it was his thought. And when he went to get his thought, he entered into the heart of Judas, and Judas betrayed Christ because Judas gave Satan ground. But we have to say, no ground. No ground. You know, I, I was sharing, I don't know if the young man is here, that I was sharing with the other day about competition. You know, in the believer, there's no competition. There's no disappointment in the believer. Because the word of God says in Romans chapter 10, verse 11, that whosoever believeth in the Lord Jesus Christ will never be ashamed or disappointed. And you don't have to take disappointment. You don't have to take shame. And when, uh, when shame comes, you can say, uh-uh, no ground. Jesus promised I would never be ashamed or disappointed. And you know what he said? He said, we have this earthen, we have this heavenly treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God's and not of us. And do you know where Satan gets us all hung up at? We're so busy looking at the clay pot and trying to perfect the clay pot. The treasure is what's important and it's in the pot. And the clay pot becomes priceless because of the treasure, not be the treasure doesn't become priceless because of the clay pot. You see, we got to get our eyes, all we'll ever be is clay pots. But Christ that filleth all in all in us is building and making himself manifested through clay pots. Isn't that exciting that God chose you and I to show the world himself. And he made the provision by his spirit to bring about the transforming power, to bring that reality of that mirror that he can look in and see himself reflected. That the mirror doesn't have to take care of itself, but the mirror just has to allow itself to be looked after. <laughs> you know, any of you ever bring a child into the world and throw it in a corner and look over and say, grow, 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 huh? Anybody here ever do that? But when, when that child is born, you take it as a gift from God and you nurture it and you train it and you look after it and you protect it even to the point of your own life. And God the Father loves us enough to do the same thing. We don't have to fight to keep our inheritance. We just have to know it's ours and stand on it. The Lord said, Ev, I don't have to fight to keep you. He said, do you know why I don't have to fight to keep you? And I said, no, Lord. He said, I just simply refuse to let you go. I'm not going to turn you loose. I'll never 
let go your hair. You might squirm, you might kick, you might holler, you might even have the desire and try to get away from me, but I'll never let go your hand. I refuse to give any groan, God says to the enemy. What about you? What about you? Are you willing to be everything that God has said that you're supposed to be by standing up and say, I am going to possess the land. I'm going to occupy this house that God said is mine. I am going to occupy my world if it's no bigger than a kitchen. I am going to occupy my world if it's no bigger than a draft board. I am going to occupy my world if it's no bigger than a machine. I am going to, if, it's, if you're a pastor of a church, I'm going to occupy my ground and I refuse to allow the enemy to come in and get a foothold anywhere because I'm going to tell him I don't care what shape and what form he comes in, no ground. And all I ask for, Lord, is give me wisdom to know what the enemy is doing and where he's coming from. And the word of God said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who abradeth not and neither is any valuableness or shadow of his turning. Lord, I don't know where the enemy is, but you said I'm supposed to give me the wisdom, give me the ability, the discernment to know so I can holler like every other man just like my Christ and say no ground there is nothing in me that belongs to the enemy because there's no ground I'm not going to give him a ground mentally I'm not giving him any ground physically I'm not giving him any ground morally I'm not giving him any ground sexually I'm not giving him any ground in thought I'm not giving him any ground in word I'm not giving him any ground in deed because Christ filleth all in me and there's no ground no ground no ground Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. I purpose in my heart to never let there be any ground for Satan in me. And I don't know where he might come. So now unto him who's able, hallelujah, to do it and to make me aware where the ambushers might come. Lord, send your guardian angels and keep track of the ambushers. And you set up an ambush for the ambushers so that I might be free and possess the land that is flowing with milk and honey. Because you promised, Jesus, that wherever the soles of my feet tread, you'd give it to me for inheritance. And I intend to occupy everything that you've given to me. I intend to occupy for my children. I intend to occupy for my husband. I intend to occupy for my mother. I intend to occupy for my friends. I intend to occupy for my sisters and brothers because Lord, you said I was an overcomer and for those that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. So I'm going through the land proclaiming no ground, no ground. Wherever I am, there's no ground for Satan. No ground whatsoever, because where there's one, they'll put a thousand to fight, and where there's two, they'll put ten thousand to flight, and all of us is more than what the world can even stand. Hallelujah. No ground. <laughs> Praise God. Lord, help us to purpose in our heart, in our reality, that there's no ground. There's nothing in me that belongs to the enemy, because I surrender all. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? In your heart, does the spirit control? You'll only be blessed and find peace and sweet rest when you give him your body and your soul. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. They're yours. They belong to you, Jesus. And I've delivered the word. And Lord, make it real. And Lord, I ask you in the mighty name of Jesus and in the power of his spirit not to let one tittle or one iota of your word fall to the ground without giving you a hundredfold return. Do it for the praise of your glory. And I thank you in advance. And I hedge them in with the shed blood of Jesus. I blanket and cover them with the shed blood of Jesus. 
I surround them with your divine love and wisdom. And Lord, in my heart, I purpose that in these, your people, there will be no ground for the enemy of their soul. Because Lord, I'm like Paul. I'm fully persuaded that you are able to keep whatever I commit to your care. And Lord, I commit these people individually and collectively unto you. And Lord, it wasn't the, the enemy of their soul that stole the word out of their heart. It was the cares of life. It was moving from one thing to the next thing, having to do the little things like pull up tents, like do the dishes, like look after the children. So Lord, I'm just hedging them in in a practical way that in everything you, they do, everything, every place that they move that you have absolute full sway, make it real to them in ways that they will be able to comprehend and understand. And Lord, we purpose never to let go your hand. Linda, would you come and help me to sing that song? I don't know why I want to sing tonight, but it's okay. Anyhow, I don't have to understand. And it's another song that uh, our CFO wrote, wrote J Joel Hayden. And that is, he, I, he'll never let go of my hand. You got the words? <laughs> got the tune? You got that. I'll mm -hmm. just jump okay. in and I'll follow you. Let me see. I'll never let go of my hand. He'll He will never let go my hand. He will never let go my hand. He will never let go my hand. Though I walk in rain, though I walk in pain, he will never let go my hand. He will never He will never let go my hand. And do you know what you're singing when you say, he'll never let go my hand? He's, you're saying, I know, God, that you got a hold of me, and you ain't going to never <laughs> let me go. Why? Because I don't belong to anybody but you, and you're going to hold your own ground. And I praise God that I'm not a miserable light anymore. God bless you.